The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome to Full Stature Ministries, Kingdom Life Church. And uh, you need to pray for me. I'm serious. Those of you watching on YouTube, I want your prayers. Because guess what? I am so excited. I can't wait for Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And each day is different. I'm convinced that Sundays is carrying the, the, the word of the Lord that is uh, prevalent in the, in the need for the saints, okay? And that's really what it should be. Uh, but Tuesdays is something that we decided to do to where it, there's not a teaching per se, but it's a time of soaking, uh, it's a time of sharing, but it's entering into a one accord anointing that is just beautiful. Some people are, what's a one accord anointing? I'll tell you what, you'd have to come and experience it to know what I'm talking about. There's a corporate anointing that cannot be matched by you individually, no matter how spiritual you are, you cannot have a corporate anointing by yourself. It'd be nice if we could, but then I'd have to do deliverance on you because there's only one in there, and that's you. All right? And the third is Thursdays, and it's emotional healing and deliverance, and no teaching per se other than just enough to know what direction we're going in. And so, it's, it, to me, it's just uh, making ready of people prepared for what's coming. And one, you have to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying on Sunday. It's not just for information. It's not for entertainment. But you're supposed to see to what degree is that speaking to me. How does that word discerning me? And... What is my level of obedience? See, God's not looking for your sacrifice and your dead works. He's saying, I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. So he that has ears to hear, hear what is he speaking to you personally. And keeping in mind that before we get into uh, what I want to talk about today, today is discerning voices. Oh boy, that sounds like we're all need. We're all gonna, we're all going to need to talk to somebody. Uh, all right, discerning voices. We'll have fun with that title. People go, what? That's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. But first and foremost, uh, to discern is to distinguish, to differentiate, to identify the source of words and circumstances. The source of words and circumstances. But there is, and this, is, this has to preface everything, so if you're a note taker, make sure you wrote, write down that I said this before I get into all the other stuff. There is absolutely no accuracy without the Word of God. You don't discern without the Word of God. The Word of God has to be first place. The Word discerns, for the Word of God is quick and powerful, right? Hebrews 4.12, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it discerns. It divides asunder. It says, this is flesh, this is spirit. This is good, this is bad. So in reality, your primary relationship with God should be get into the Word of God because there's no real discernment. Don't tell me God said this and God said that and you have no idea what the Word says, right? That's dangerous. So I wanted to make sure that that was stated right up front. Uh, but the Word discerns you by searching of the heart. Search me, O oh God, for anxious thoughts, hurtful ways, Okay. And, uh, and we also know that the scripture says uh, milk, for me, is like daily discernment. Milk is good. You drink the milk of the word, but it also says in Hebrews that by reason of use you should be teachers, and you still have need for milk. So he wants you to get into the meat of the word. And that is supernatural experience. That's not head knowledge. Supernatural experience means that the milk and the meat has been assimilated to where you own it, and you are a partaker of the divine nature, okay? Now, that's my little introduction, but what is Sunday? Sunday is he that has ears to hear, hear the word of the Lord. That's the culmination of, of how we can travel in this way of living, 
Uh, that's what the church was called in initially, the way. People who walked in the way. Do you realize that that talked more about behavior than their head knowledge? We've got to address this in the church. I'll tell you what, there's plenty of head knowledge. But are, they, are you walking in the way? Are you, could you be identified at work as someone who walks in a different, to a, meet, <laughs> a beat to a different drummer? Do they recognize your Christian walk as being distinctly different than the world of flesh and the devil? Again, and the Didache that we taught, the first century church, before there was even a New Testament, the apostles of Jesus, the 12 apostles who heard Jesus directly, and also Old Testament scriptures, they taught the Gentiles that, that you know, everything they taught was behavior. It was behavior in that intimacy with God. It wasn't head knowledge. It wasn't trying to make you some kind of an expert mentally. They were trying to say, this is a way of life. There's a way that leads to death, and there's a way that leads to life, and great is the chasm between the two. That's the way they instructed newbies. That's smart, right? So there's no gray areas. That's, that's what culture does, gray areas. Culture wants to water down the gospel and give you gray areas. All right, so now I'm going to start with discerning voices. Now, I did, I did specify the primary way is the Word of God, right? And without it, don't worry about the voices. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. And I use two scriptures for this all the time. Uh, one, the standard way we've heard it was the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and every high thing or argument that exalts itself against what? the Word of God, against the knowledge of God, against the real experiential knowledge of God. We want to pull those things down, all right? So the first category that we need to understand in a general way, and this is our term, uh, you probably won't find this term anywhere, but I realize that when the Word of God is the ultimate authority in my life, and if I put the Word of God first place as I'm supposed to, I am under the government of voice. Write that down and think about it for a while under the government of voice. Because this is going to teach you jurisdiction. This is going to teach you adjudication. This is going to, it's going to teach you how to live life. The government of voice. Isaiah 66.6 says, The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, and the voice of the Lord. <laughs> You know, that, that contrast is interesting because it, the voice from the temple might not be the voice of the Lord. Huh? That's why you are supposed to discern the voice. You're supposed to discern, is love on the source of that? Is the nature of my Jesus on that word? Devil can quote scripture, all right? And we need to see that there's a battle going on. But uh, my sheep hear my voice. Are you a sheep? Then you're going to be sensitive to that voice. Now, uh, I like the message translation of the weapons of our warfare, not carnal. We use this in all of our modules because it, it, it creates a very simple process of, of when you encounter God. Here's the process of the way it works. It says we have our powerful God tools. I like that. Weapons of our warfare, God tools. We have these God tools for smashing warped philosophies, arguments, that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. They tear down barriers that have been erected against the truth. There's your strongholds coming down. And then God doesn't destroy you. He simply takes every loose thought, every loose emotion, every loose impulse, and he puts them together and puts them together in a life that's shaped by Jesus. He says, I don't want to annihilate your mind, will, and emotions. I want them surrendered and let me shape them into something beautiful. And that's the new creation reality. And we're going to get into the problems, though, that we see in the church that uh, prevent you from walking in the new creation reality the way you should. All right? Now, there's uh, six voices. And the first, of course, is the voice of God. I'm going to cover six voices that you need to understand. And we're going to discern. Now, if uh, I was training some newbies, I would take this one truth that the battleground uh, 
is in communication. Communication can be thought, word, or, or deed. Communication can be a feeling, inner knowing. It can be a feeling, it can be a seeing, it can be a hearing. All right? But here's the most important part. Say, okay, he's coming to the important part. He says every part's important. Well, this part's really important. Picture this. This is the way we put it on a diagram. All voices, all communication is like a straight line and an arrow. Can you see that in your mind's eye? A straight line, communication. That's words, okay? Or impressions. Or somehow something's communicating. Now, communication is the straight line, and that's where almost everybody quits. What is necessary is there's a little dotted line. That's the way we teach it, a little dotted line. That on every communication, there is a line of authority. Communication and authority. There's two lines. One is the words themselves. The other is what's behind the word, the authority that it's coming from. Good or evil, but it's got an authority behind it. Advertisements can have greed behind it. It can have lust behind it. So what would you say if, if you heard something that sounded really over-the-top, manipulative? You'd say, these are the words that it's saying. I just, I just want you to have a break today. I just want you to get away. Because I, I love you. All right? Wouldn't that be a good little logo? You deserve a break today. You need to get away. But what's on it is kind of self-serving. That's advertising in general, right? But you know that. But what about the people who do not discriminate with the voices and they do not make a distinction, they do not make a differentiation, and they go, you're right. I think I better go. Then it worked. And that is, advertising actually has that intent. But if you know the intent, you can say yes or no. Maybe I will. You know what? I think I'll stop by and you know have a burger and fries. Okay, um, not mentioning any names, but I'm discriminating. I'm making a distinction. I know the source, so I hear the communication, but I know the source. If you put that straight line and that dotted line, and and ran everything through that test, you would cultivate daily discernment which is still the milk of the word, until you get to the point where you mature. And having exercised your senses, you've matured it into strong meat. Strong meat belongs to those who have their senses exercised to discriminate, differentiate, discern between not just good and evil, but what kind of good, what kind of evil. We need to cultivate that, that uh, palate of, of understanding, I called them flavors when I was a young Christian. I could tell there's certain flavors on certain people's words that they just weren't right. And then others were hesitant and everything, but the, it was good. Um, and you can usually tell by what we used to call it uh, jada. That was the way I memorized it because I saw it every time we'd go to a church, you would see it. Jada was taking a person and teaching them J, jurisdiction. Because without that, you're an accident going somewhere to happen. A, in that jurisdiction, are you adjudicating? Do you rule in that area through Christ? Jurisdiction, know your jurisdiction. Know when it's not your jurisdiction. Know when in your jurisdiction you are adjudicating. In other words, is Jesus ruling in that arena? Whatever that arena is. And then, D, real spiritual work, spiritual warfare, the weapons of our warfare, the powerful God tools. Really, uh, you can say a lot of stuff, you can do a lot of antics and everything, and I've seen it all, but I'll tell you what, displacement is the key indication that something has transpired for the better. In other words, displacement means that God's presence or the fruit of the Spirit has displaced any carnality. And you know if it did or not. 
Displacement is spiritual victory. That's real spiritual warfare. That's the weapons of our warfare when they're being used. And I like the uh, uh, every loose thought, emotion, and impulse that tells you it's got to be mind, will, and emotions, and a structure that's shaped by... And it says, get this, for all the ones who say, i got to get somebody to do that to me. All of these tools are ready and at hand. <laughs> oh, no. The God tools are ready at hand. So if I'm alone, I should be able to use my God tools. It's not wrong to have people confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. But on the other hand, you've got to live life pretty much between you and Jesus. Then out of that healthy relationship, you can interact with people. Now, all right, so you, on these six voices, obviously the first one is the voice of God. But the most important thing that you could write down, and because discernment is the weakness in the area, picture those two lines. What is the straight line? Communication. Words. And sometimes it's not even words. It can be a picture. You know, it can be a feeling. But it's communicating something. And the better you develop that, the healthier you're going to be with voices. Uh, keep in mind, almost all of us pastors, we've had to deal with Christians who they love the Lord, they're all their heart, but how many times have we heard, how many times have you heard, you've got Christian friends, God said, and I know that I know that I know that I know, even with minimal discernment, God didn't say that to them. And what do you usually do? You let them go. You don't control them. You let them make the mistake. But you know what? At my age now, I'm going to start telling them. Maybe. I'll, I'll pray about it. I'll pray about it. But anyway. <laughs> but he, the uh, voice of the Lord, is that not the most important? And what we're doing on Mondays here, soaking in his presence, you know what you're doing? You're quieting your noisy mind, will, and emotions so that his presence comes up. And what you then feel, yes, feel, you feel his nature. And eventually, by reason of use, you will know when you hear words if it has that nature on it. Do you ever see that? Do you ever see that little thing on oh, Facebook? You know, if it's on Facebook, it's got to be true. Um, <laughs> But there was a thing on Facebook where a shepherd would call the sheep with a certain phrase. And they would all lift up their heads at the same time. They'd get it on camera. Someone else would imitate and say the exact words, but it wasn't the shepherd. They didn't even look up. That's how discerning they were. Isn't that beautiful? That's the way we need to be with Jesus. We need to know when we hear something in our head that's not him. You have that responsibility to cultivate that. And we're telling you, Mondays you cultivate that. Thursdays you get set free because you've learned to differentiate. And you know it's not God. You can get rid of it. And that's what we're doing. I I'm living for Mondays if they're supposed to be. Pray for me because I think there's something very exciting. Tuesdays are for soaking and experiencing God and interaction and sharing and entering one accord. Thursday is ministry. So um, if you can make it, come on Thursday. <laughs> I'll say that until we have no room. Uh, the whole church needs ministry, so we'll see. The universal church, that is. But, uh, uh, and if you're out of state, call on the phone. And I've done plenty of that lately, and the results are phenomenal. So God is doing something good you don't want to miss out. All right? And now we have our new Pennsylvania representative, uh, so if you have need and you're watching by video and you're in Pennsylvania, we'll, give, we'll recommend uh, uh, Angela to you, all right? Now, these six voices, the voice of God. The second voice. And, you know, some people want to argue uh, politics or situation. Don't even waste your time with me because if your only input is uh, mainline news, there's nothing to argue. You haven't even researched anything. You know, you have to go beyond just what you hear people say, your friends say, peer pressure at school. That's not even worth an argument. You've been pretty much thoroughly indoctrinated by the voice of the world. The voice of the world is a system that includes culture, and it tells you you need to look like this, act like this, talk like this. 
and to the degree that that communication has authority in your life. It made a connection with you, you own it. But I see, so what a waste of time to argue with someone who's not even able to distinguish between other voices, saying, oh, well, that's just advertising. Oh, well, that's just a commercial. Oh, well, that's just a movie. There is so much manipulation going on in movies. They have a narrative. If you can't see through the narrative, then maybe you ought to get a little closer to Jesus. All right? I mean, everything in Hollywood comes with a narrative. Can you distinguish? Can you differentiate? Can you hear the voice of the Lord compared to the voice of the world? All right? But God forbid that I would uh, boast in anything, says Paul except in the cross of the Lord Jesus, who by, who by that cross the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Isn't that a beautiful statement? I hear the, I hear the voice, but I've been crucified to it. I, I, and, you know, it's very uh, current for young people right now. I hear, see it on television, so it's got to be something in the culture because television reveals a culture. News reveals a culture. Don't judge me. Have you ever heard that? Well, guess what? Judge, from a biblical point of view, is to condemn. But assess? I have to make assessments all day long in ministry. All day long. You do too. You have to look at your budget and how much groceries you're going to buy. That's, don't, don't judge me by how much I spend. Well, how about assessing what you should spend? And quit calling it judging. Judge is to condemn, to write off. All right? So, uh, crucify. All these voices need to be brought to the cross other than Jesus. All right? Then there's the voice of the devil. And he appeals. What did he do in the garden? This will be good for you. I love John Bevere's book, Everything That Is Good Is Not Necessarily God. <laughs> There was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? All right. The voice of the devil wars against the believer because it, it agitates. If you feel agitated, it could be an external force that's not God. It agitates and it wants to get strongholds of the flesh, the mind, will, and emotions. It wants to hitchhike. It wants to attach. The devil wants to... But here's the process, and this is so simple that once you learn this, you can... You can uh, in daily prayer, wash yourself free from it. It wants to connect. It's got to make a connection. You deserve a break today. Now, if that was the devil, tell me I need a break today. You, deserve, you don't need to go to church. You need to rest up. You've been tired. You don't need relationships with all those people. I, you are the church. You are corporate by yourself. No. Well, anyway... All right, but it says, it says that when this voice of the devil says, take the apple, it would be good. Good is not always God. If you feel creepy on something that's good, it's probably not good. You have to discern, differentiate what authority is on that wonderful word that that would be good for me. All right. Uh, we're going to move through these voices a little quicker. I want to get to the, the heavy stuff. I want to get to the deep stuff. This is, all right. And there's the voice of the past. Uh, the past speaks to us most loudly through unhealed wounds. As a matter of fact, every mental stronghold in your life, every lie that is contrary to the Word of God, came in at the time of emotional wounding. So there's lies and there's strongholds. Strongholds came in when you got hurt. And then that stronghold has authority. It has, it has jurisdiction now over the way you view things. It has, it's adjudicating. It's ruling in your head. Regardless of even if you know better, a stronghold is more powerful than willpower. You've got to defeat it through the cross. Been crucified to the world. I've been crucified. Uh, you know, the voice of the past. The, the, don't mean, it doesn't mean we'll never hear the voice again, but here's the way you can tell you're getting healed up. Is you don't throw a voice in the sea of forgetfulness and never hear it again, but when you hear the communication, 
Oh, uh, I used to I used to smoke a lot of pot. But on that is peace. You know what that means? I've been delivered. The voice that's attached or the source that's attached to that truth is actually now a testimony. A testimony means I passed the test. I took it to the cross and God revealed redemption. God revealed transformation, sanctification. You can use whatever word you want, but the line of authority and the line of communication. And by the way, when you get good at this, uh, you pick it up, you start getting used to picking up the source regardless of the content. Ladies, I asked this one. All Christians have done it. Have you ever had someone compliment you and it didn't feel real? You were probably right. Could have been a jealous person. Jealous people, well, now women are different, not the men. The men would go into competitive mode. You know. But anyway, we won't go there. That's a separate subject. And you're not going to want Miss Sunday. I am biting at the bit to get into the next Sundays, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to finish this message. So, all right, we're going to discern voices today. And the voice of God is telling me, wait till next week, Dennis. All right, that's God. I know it. All right, so you've got the voice of the past, and the voice of the past comes because it means there was a wound. And then it's a repetitive statement, and it's become a stronghold. All mental strongholds, all came in at a time of emotional wounding. They got ground. The way the enemy works, and I write this down because you'll, you'll hear this in a lot of messages, because it's, a, it's from the initial encounter to the subsequent process of the Holy Spirit, it's always the same. Connect, own, express. God wants to make the connection with you. He wants you to own that word of God so it's written on the tablet of your heart so that you express it. And it's easier to do that word than not do it. But the devil he works from the outside. God's working from the inside. The devil works from the outside. He wants to connect with you. Oh, don't listen to those people. You can stay in that sin. You're not hurting anybody. Connect. If he gets you to own that statement, you will express it, and then if you want to change it with willpower, it won't work. Willpower is not... Willpower can override certain things temporarily, but eventually it'll pop out. Most people, when they've gotten good ministry, you say, test the spirit. Walk it out. If they don't know what walk it out means, you have to explain it. You need to enjoy it and live in it for a while. And revel, revel in the fact that I am not doing what I used to do. As a matter of fact, what used to make me have a total meltdown, now it just irritates me. What would that tell you? It would say you're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of God. It doesn't say you'll never get irritated. It just says what used to cause you a meltdown now is irritating. Then you can deal with it. You're making progress. All right. So we have the voice of God, the voice of the world, the voice of the devil, and the power of the cross nullifies the work of the devil that through the death, the cross, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, okay? Now, the voice of the past, you know, he who began a good work will continue it. But when he continues that good work, it's going to be old stuff is going to not have the pain with it. So when you have something old pop in your head and you talk about it and say it out loud, if the pain is gone, that area is set apart for God permanently. You are known by God and owned by God. Now, the, uh, the fifth voice, the voice of the flesh. This has to do with your appetites, passions, and desires. I know most of you don't, but some people, some of us like donuts. All right? And the voice of the flesh, I can even see this scripturally. If I could see, like if I was uh, invisible, like a plastic man, I can even see how it works scripturally. It's like each person is drawn away by their lust. Lust of the eyes, lust of... So I go, donuts. Well, here's me and Jesus down here enjoying fellowship. Donuts. Did you notice I'm drawing away from God as I give power to that lust? Lust is going to conceive. When it conceives, it's going to give birth. 
gives birth, guess what? It's going to rise up and kill me eventually. Matter of fact, the message even says that. Lust has a baby. It's called sin. Sin, when it grows up, is a real killer. Interesting translation. But anyway, but then what do I do as a Christian? I want those donuts. I could picture eating them off the Krispy Kreme conveyor belt with the hot icing flowing. Come on, isn't that good? All right. And, and God is not my primary focus at this moment. And then I go, oh, I, I shouldn't do that. I just gained five pounds already. Uh, draw a night of God. Where's God? In me. Draw a night of God. And it's like, the, uh, Madame Guyon called it the law of central tendency. It's like gravity. You draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to you with a magnetic pull. He's there to run after you. You return to him, he runs after you. You might be dragging your feet a little bit. No, I shouldn't eat them. Don't, uh, and he's running to you. Then, oh, I love you, Dennis. You could, maybe one. <laughs> I differentiated. All right. Now, that's the voice of the flesh. And Paul, again, did you notice all through scriptures, all these voices, he made it clear that he died to these voices. Those who are messiahs have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires, Galatians 5.24. So you bring it to the cross, you crucify it. There's no renouncing a, 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 a stronghold simply by saying it. There has to be a work of the cross. There has to be forgiveness. There has to be a repentance. Now, the sixth voice is the voice of your human spirit. And I love it. This is what we want to do on Tuesdays when we're soaking in the presence, we're coming into one accord, we're sharing from the heart what is rising up to us that flesh and blood did not reveal to us but our Father in heaven. So the voice of the human spirit, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 16, 15 through 17. This is what we're looking for on Tuesday night. Tuesday night is there's no agenda other than we're coming together in one accord and let's see what the Lord lifts up. Revelation, that flesh and blood's not teaching, but that what we're hearing, the voice of God for ourselves corporately. And some people, uh, they've been Christians for years, but corporate life has, they're not ready for it yet. And that really needs healed up, because that's, that's not the way God made you. Individual identity, who you are, individual gifting, corporate identity is a is a, somewhat of a rarity, except for in this church, you haven't seen it until you've been here on a Tuesday. The corporateness, the level of maturity, the level of oneness, it is the closest thing I've seen to one accord. And by the way, God says, you're not a church, you're going to birth a church. So I think we're in a birthing process. And how did, they, how did it birth all through the Old and New Testament? When they were as one. God came with a significance. You can't do that by yourself. What was that statement? I don't, I don't have to be connected with other Christians. I am the church. Well, we used to say, where do we hear that? Well, you can be married and not go home. <laughs> but eventually, the relationship will suffer. And that's what God's saying. You need people. You need one another. You need relationship. And so, uh, ask the Lord to reveal to you. You know what Zinzendorf did? He didn't have home groups by, well, if you live over here, you go to that home group. You live over here, you go to that home group. You, he watched how people interacted and encouraged it. Because there's a knitting of the hearts. There's relationships that come together. I mean, it, it could be a science in itself. Friendships could be a science in itself. Well, what, you know, kinship. So the voice of the human spirit is the voice that connects us through our human spirit. All right, now you ready for the deep stuff? Let's start with, we're talking about discerning voices. We covered six voices. Um, but stronghold is what I want to deal with. Because you can hear a lie in your head and dismiss it, right? You can hear a lie in your head and dismiss it. Strongholds, however, mm -mm, they're lodged. They need the God tools. They need the weapons of your warfare. A lie manifests, and here's a way to identify one, a truce, I'm talking not just a lie, I'm talking a stronghold, uh, manifests as a repetitive, intrusive thought. 
You may have been a Christian for 20 years, and on and off you've heard that same thing for 20 years. That would be a stronghold. And what's it doing? It's exalting itself against the knowledge of God. There's certain aspects of God you'll never know until that stronghold is removed because it is, it's, it's got its authority. But fortunately, our God tools or the weapons of our warfare are such that we can demolish that philosophy, that lie that comes against the Word of God. Now, a repetitive, intrusive thought is the way you characteristically find a stronghold. Jeez, I should have made this two parts. Always connected to a negative emotion. Write that down. That's for the people who have all these other methods to deal with this stuff and don't see a lot of results. It's because if you don't get the source, the source, the source, you're not differentiating, you're not making a distinction, you're not going to see a result by vain repetition. Repetitive, intrusive thought is always connected to a negative emotion. And it got started at the time of an emotional wounding. There it is. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14 and 5 says, Beware lest any bitter root spring up, cause you trouble, and even defile others. A stronghold will make you behave toward others in ways that are not Christ-like. And it's stronger than your willpower. The cycle will be an ongoing cycle that's repetitive, but you never know when it's going to repeat itself. Certain situations can, like they say, push your button. But, and we'll cover this later, but it may have historical evidence, but it's still unscriptural. It's not what God or the new creation would say. And it's a good way to check yourself. When you hear something, you hear a voice, and you're trying to discern if that's God, is it, is it unscriptural? Is it what you would say if you love God and love this word? Start from that premise. No matter where you're at in the level of maturity, if you started with the premise, I love God and love his word, that will clarify a whole lot of stinking thinking. I love God and love his word. That's the real me. Yeah, I've got issues, but the real me loves God, loves his word, is that thought contributing to that? And it says this, this bitter root that springs up in Hebrews 12, it says, it causes you trouble and defiles others. It's like I can't help myself. I'm, about, I'm just being bad to them, all right, whether you know it or not. Well, it'll attract perpetrators that defiles others. It attracts perpetrators. You've seen people get in the wrong marriage relationship again and again, and it's the same problem. They have probably have a bitter root and attracted that perpetrator. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's a bitter root expectancy. It's almost like, well, watch, when I do this, this is what's going to happen. Yep, self-fulfilling prophecies. The fearful and the desponding scripturally, bring those things upon themselves. Probably blame God. But here's the way it works. Uh, these defiling of other people are intermittent. It's like gambling. One of the worst things you can do and one of the strongest addictions is gambling because there's what they call intermittent reinforcement. That means you could spend your entire savings and then one time hit it and it will fuel to where you're going to keep gambling. Because I won one time. You can't explain that logically to a gambler, but the, the, the internal mechanism of intermittent reinforcement doesn't. That's why even when you discipline your children, you discipline them the same. You don't have a bad day and let them do whatever they want to do, and the next day you tell them that's wrong. You know, intermittent reinforcement. Remember, Allison did it to me, remember? She's 13 years old. She goes, Denny, can I drive the car? And I go, no, you're 13. You don't have a driver's license. Allison, why did you even ask me that? And she goes, because what if? What if I didn't ask and you had some kind of a temporary meltdown and said, okay, go ahead? 
Hers was perfectly logical, but that's kind of that's kind of like a gambler's mentality, isn't it? Well, nobody wins, so somebody might. Lottery tickets are a good example of that. There's usually a motive there with getting something for nothing that could be dealt with. And you find out there's a root to that. Now, a stronghold or intermittent. Here's the way it progresses. Remember we said connect, own, and express? If, if you would meditate on that, you could, could get yourself set free from a lot of voices that are not God, that come against the beauty of your new creation reality, of who God says you are. You love God, love his word. But here's another progress. It starts as a suggestion, moves to distraction, and dominates. That's a stronghold. Oh, it wouldn't hurt to just a little bit. But in the meantime, while you're being distracted, right now, um, who was it? The uh, Rules for Radicals, right, Jennifer? Saul. Rules for Radicals, Saul Alinsky. That's what he would do. You've got to get distracted and focus on something to get their attention off it. And that mere suggestion that seems so innocent is a distraction to keep you from focused on what you should be focused on and eventually it'll dominate you. You can't stop thinking about that. Connect, own, and express. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. All right. So, uh, and what, what does it do once that distraction dominates? It, uh, it blocks your ability to hear truth. Hmm? Remember the, remember the little girl that she wanted a, 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 a husband, uh, she wanted a father for her child so bad, and her pastor couldn't talk to her, so they called us up to have us minister to her. She wouldn't listen to us either, and she just said, God's telling me that the next person that knocks on my door is, is, is my husband, and he'll be a father to my son. He knocked on the door, the man had mental illness, said he was a Christian, but he actually thought he was Jesus. And get this, because there was a lust attached to that desire, not a prayer request, but a lust attached to it, she lost her child. She lost custody. So the very thing you demand to have sometimes, you better hold it with loose hands and see what God has for you. God's got something better than you could get for yourself. So don't stick your own initiative in it. So the very thing that she insisted on having was the very thing that caused her to lose. It blocks your ability to hear truth. She wouldn't hear pastor. She wouldn't hear. If somebody says, I know God said, and, they won't, and they're too afraid to even bounce it off of somebody else. You don't have to agree with other people. You don't have to agree with every pastor. Actually, they're on the bottom of the list as far as authority. The number one authority is the very nature of God. And that even supersedes his word. Because the devil can quote his word. I want the nature of God as the ultimate authority. But if you don't know the nature of God, you are subject to any old voice. That sounds good. The nature of God, the word of God, conscience. Conscience is third because conscience is only as reliable as your word level. If you don't know the word... I can't go by your conscience. It's not safe. <laughs> you have this value system that's contrary to the Word of God. And lastly, spiritual authority. So actually, we as leaders and pastors, we're on the bottom of the list of spiritual authority, but that doesn't mean it's not significant. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't know who your pastor is, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't know who do I go to in the realm of spiritual. I had a spiritual father my entire Christian life. And it saved me a lot of aggravation. They didn't make me do anything, but they certainly weren't afraid to tell me. Hmm? For 30, must have been 36 years at least, I sat with six pastors that were more mature than me, senior in my age, for years and years, and it saved me so much. I didn't have to agree with everything they said, 
but I certainly did respect the fact that they had learned some things the hard way, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It was like, it was like a friend of mine whose, whose sister was very mouthy, and she would mouth off to her parents. And he sat back there. He, he became an eye surgeon, but he came back and goes, when I grow up, I'm not going to do what she's doing. That wisdom? She got smacked constantly for talking back. And he goes, when I grow up, I'm not going to do that. So you can learn from other people's stuff, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, let's cover with this exalting itself against the knowledge of God. This is, if you've got time to write this down, I'm going to try to go slow. This is the way you should evaluate these things. We call this troubleshooting, but uh, again, the character of God. If what you hear, those thoughts, those voices, if it's a, we just simply say it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, well, what does that mean even? Well, against the word of God and that which is scriptural and scripture, but here it is. If you hear something that's against the character of God, I promise you it's not God. <laughs> God is harsh and not fair. Come on, I, I run into Christians all the time. I have to deal with this. This is, not, this is not in some corner, a distant corner. This is directly exalting itself against a real knowledge of God. You're... you're Punishing yourself if you engage in this thought and have given it place. You give place to this, you've created a stronghold. God is harsh and not fair. God won't give me what I think I need. You're actually working for the devil. So you can complain all you want. But this judgment against God, if you don't remove it, you are subject to these thoughts, you're subject to the enemy. God won't provide for me or protect me. Well, then you have to find all these false ways, substitutes. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns or substitutes because there's no void in anybody's life. You filled it with God or with a substitute. You need to get rid of some of these substitutes. Okay, here's another one. If it exalts itself against the truth of God's word. I know the Bible says, but... I guarantee you that is not the voice of God. I know the Bible says, but. And the younger you go in our culture, the more they've been shaped by the culture, the more they've got a lot of those. If you don't have that foundation, you don't really, you're, you're on shaky ground. You're on sand. The third one, against the new creation identity. We saw this on our Thursday ministry, and we're going to continue to see more of it. We're going to have healthy people here on Thursday. And, and minimal, they won't need ministry forever. They're going to deal with this stuff. But here's the one that I see. Uh, we call it the false personality. But against the new creation. Here's three of the lies that come with the new... Strongholds that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and what God says about you. I was born this way. This is who I am. I get weary. It's like, I'm a failure. This is who I am. Oh, yeah, I could see God in heaven go, oh, let's see. Uh, Mrs. Smith, I'm going to put a child in her. I'm going to knit a, a, a beautiful child. Oh, if she could see how beautiful I see her while I'm knitting her in her mother's womb. Um, her characteristic is going to be a failure. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to make a failure. She's going to be a failure. That doesn't even seem rational that you would believe these lies. But I was born this way. It's just who I am. Here's the worst one. And we need to break that spirit right now. This is the way I always will be. Those are strongholds. If any of these are resonating with you, you need to get with somebody, get with God first, but you need to pray with somebody on this. These are serious accusations that will hinder your destiny. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. The fourth one. Against your personal value. We'll see this on Thursdays. Get over here on Thursday if you need this ministry on this. Um, 7 o'clock Thursday, 7 o'clock Tuesday, and you could be in good shape pretty soon. Pretty soon. By reason of use. I'm not worthy. 
you ever heard that in your head? I did something too bad. Oh, your sin is bigger than anything Jesus could have died for. But you can believe that. I did something too bad. I'm not good enough. I'm damaged goods. God couldn't really love me. Do you think God's, that's God's voice? Saying, I can't really love you. Come on. Some of these should be obvious, but guess what? To a lot of people, they own it. It made a connection. They own it, and they will express it out of their own mouth and lifestyle and act like it. Do you think we need deliverance from strongholds? You better believe it. Because just because you know your Bible and you say, I love God and love His Word, doesn't mean you're expressing it. Now, the fifth one. I am such a failure. I will fail if I try, so I don't try. Because what if I tried and then I failed? That would only prove that I'm a failure. So, never try anything. I never measure up. Never and always there's a sign of emotional a need for emotional healing. Always and never. Because in the natural, that's not even accurate. You never make me the chicken soup that I like. Um, do you think there might even be a slight exaggeration in that? Must have made it once. <laughs> never, always. That's a sign of hurt that's got to be dealt with. There's a stronghold attached to that, and it's got to come down. I'm such a failure. I will fail if I try, so I don't try. I never measure up. I, I can never do anything right. When I did stuff wrong, you know what God took me to? Micah 7, it says, when I fall, I learn from it, get up. Don't stay down, get up learn from it, and then do what's right. Lies is another category. I'm going to try to cover two more categories. Lies versus the historical evidence. This is a tough one because... Uh, the most difficult lies are those with historical evidence. In other words, a person who believes a lie like no man ever pays attention to me can tell you many examples of being ignored. So you have history. History doesn't make it scriptural. History makes it factual. So that happened. You want to stay there or you want to re remove that stronghold and find out what, is the, what does God say? instead of what your opinion is that has fashion of stronghold. Now, so historical evidence. Just because you have a history of it, some of those are some of the most difficult ones to minister to people because, but it's true. It's so hard to deal with someone who believes a lie because they have history. History does not make it scriptural. History does not mean it's coming from the voice of God. That's something you connected with, owned it, and are expressing it, but it's not the real you. It's a false personality. And you can be set free. So, the dealing with the horse, historical evidence is, is you, you just can't give in to that lie. Um, you gotta, it says, no one can go into a strong man's house and ransack the household goods right and left and seize them as plunder unless he first binds the strong man then indeed he may thoroughly plunder that house. We want to bring those house of thoughts that are not godly thoughts and bring them down. You want to destroy that whole framework of thinking. Now, here's the next one. And this is shame as it's connected to lies. Strongholds. I'm a bad person. If you knew the real me, you would reject me. Those are people who isolate themselves from other people. They want to keep everything secret. They don't mind hearing about other people, but they don't want you to know anything about them because you would reject me. There's rejection issues there. Deal with the rejection. You find out, guess what? They're all dysfunctional. You're not that unique. 
in your fears or apprehensions. Everybody needs work. We're in this together to move forward and upward in the things of God. I must wear a mask so that people won't know how horrible I am and reject me. My identity is a sh as a shameful person. This is who I am. Everything's my fault. I'm the blame. I have so many shortcomings that I'll never be able to overcome them. I'm trapped, helpless, hopeless. Bad things always happen to me. I can never do enough. I ought to be able to be and to do more. I am valuable because of what I do, not who I am. If I do something wrong, I will be rejected by others and or reject myself. I am on the outside looking in. I do not belong. Shameful things have happened to me because I'm bad. I'm guilty. I must work hard to prove that I'm worthy of love and a good person. I am a victim because of the people and circumstances in my life. Boy, you see that one even on secular television. Everybody's a victim. Nobody's a perpetrator. They're all victims of other people. <laughs> Boy, you need a forgiveness message if I ever heard it. Go ye and preach the forgiveness of sin. Go preach the remission of sin. Now, shame is a sense of being uniquely and hopelessly flawed. It causes a person to feel different. All right? I'm going to give you a few hindrances, and we're going to pray, pray you through these so that you learn how to deal with it in a tangible way, okay? Uh, some of the hindrances, low fellowship with the Father. I can't teach you to discern voices if you don't have a relationship with God. Without intimacy, you don't know Him. That I might know Him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of the person. Get here on Tuesday night and learn to get intimate with God. Sit still. Quiet that noisy flesh. A low word level is a hindrance to making a distinction with the voices. If you don't know your Bible at all, you're going to have a hard time. Newbies, newbies can even do this quite well if they would just get into the New Testament, get in the Gospel of John and just say, I'm going to live that, I want to meet the author. Pride. And then of all churches to go to, unforgiveness destroys discernment or differentiating between the voices. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, I don't trust any of your discernment. When I see someone angry and upset, and I can feel their spirit, they can say nice words, but when I feel they're upset in their spirit, I don't trust what you're saying. You do not have discernment. Love precedes perception. You have to have the heart of Jesus before you have the eyes of Jesus. If what's coming from the heart is all about you right now, your wisdom and your insight is valueless because the substance on it. Remember? Line of authority, line of communication. Lust counterfeits a good witness. <laughs> if you're not discriminating and you, oh, yeah, God wants me to have her. God wants me to have him. Oh, donuts. Oh, yeah. That's not God says. That's lust. And it comes across as a, we'll call it in Christianese, a good witness. By the same token, prejudice. If you have a judgment, that something, you'll say, I don't witness that. That's usually a barrier in your own heart. You know, with discerning the human spirit, it, it really helps to say, God, show me. It's that easy. All right, here's the way we would do it. You have some of these strongholds. Where did that get started? Especially if it's a stronghold is repeated throughout much of your life. Where did that get started? Release forgiveness in three directions, if necessary. It doesn't hurt if you do too much. I release forgiveness for the judgment I made against God. Why you let that happen? I receive forgiveness for having taken that lie in. And I release forgiveness to the perpetrator. God, self, others. God, self, others. Forgiveness flows in all three directions. If in doubt, do all three. All right? I pray through, first feel forgive. Then I say, what was the lie? Well, the lie said... Uh, I'm, uh, 
I'm inferior and I'm inadequate. Let's just say I'm, I'm inferior, which is pride, by the way. I, I, but I'm inferior. I've always been like this. I, I just see this. I compare myself to other people, and I know I'm inferior. All right? I receive forgiveness for taking in something that's contrary to the new creation, something that comes against what God says about me. I release forgiveness to maybe parents who told me I was inferior. You'll never amount to anything. I release forgiveness to them. And God, uh, I release any judgment against you that I feel like you made me like this. That's a lie. Now, I renounce that lie that I'm inferior. After you get peace, I renounce that lie that I'm inferior. And this is the part Jennifer loves to sit in and watch. What's the truth? It can be scripture or scriptural. What's the truth? I didn't make anybody inferior or superior. I made them to humble themselves before me and to be all that they were called to be and to do all they were called to do. Oh, I think I'll write that on the tablet of my heart. I was created by God to be and to do all that he created me to be and all that he created me to do. You know, there's no room for superiority or inferiority. There's no room in that. If you would embrace that as the uh, application of the presence of God on your heart and life, it would work. You would think that way because they'd be God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Father, seal this word by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue and we're going to see a radical move of God's Spirit on Tuesday night and Thursday night. Tuesday night's different than Thursday night, but Tuesday night will prepare you for Thursday night and we get ministry. Say amen. amen. All right. That's good. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.